the film you're about to see lasts 28 minutes. It could save your life. This is a highway, an American highway. It begins just about any place you happen to be, and it will take you almost any place you want to go, to work or to school, for shopping or for pleasure. Our highways are used by more Americans more often than any other public service that society provides. They are an indispensable part of our American way of life. They also make a gruesome contribution to our American way of death. This is an Air Force base from which the sophisticated supersonic aircraft of our Strategic Air Command fly daily missions. The average American might think of this activity as dangerous. But at the exit from this military base appears this conspicuous sign as a reminder to all who leave its relative safety for a trip on a public highway. This report is based on a continuing survey which a special subcommittee of the United States House of Representatives has been conducting for the past 12 years. It was called the Blotnick Committee until its first chairman, Congressman John Blotnick of Minnesota, became chairman of the full Public Works Committee of the House. Chairman Blotnick's quiet conferences with various members do much to supplement the energetic questioning of knowledgeable witnesses and the continuing effort to assure that America's highways are developed to the maximum safety and convenience of the American people. There are almost four million miles of highways and streets in America today, enough to circle the world 160 times. In highway construction, we take a back seat to no one. Our country has the best developed road system in the world, but we do have a problem. As rapidly as the nation has been building and improving its road system, the number of cars has grown even faster. There are half again as many more vehicles on America's streets and highways today than just 15 years ago. With more than 100 million automobiles in the nation right now, and millions more being added every year, we're having a little trouble finding places to accommodate them all in safety and many highways, fully adequate when they were built, are simply overrun by the ever-increasing volume that they're now forced to carry. And this, in part, explains why many more Americans are killed while going to the store than in going to war. In terms of violent death, the traffic collision is the greatest single killer of the American people. And viewed in that context, it becomes our greatest problem. In the past 25 years, an entire generation, for every American killed in war, 10 have lost their lives on the highways of this nation. Congress was thinking basically of this when it created the interstate highway system. On balance, the interstate system has been a spectacular success. It is the most extensive and the most expensive public works undertaking ever attempted by any nation in the history of the human race. When completed, it will have cost some $76 billion. But already it has added many times 
that amount to our economy. It has stimulated some $550 billion of private investment in new business enterprises and the creation of new jobs along the route of the interstate. Every $6,000 invested in building the highway has generated a permanent job in the private economy for somebody. Most important of all, it has saved lives. The death toll on the interstate, measured by each million passenger miles traveled, is only about half what it is on the rest of the road and street network. While building the interstate systems, we've been upgrading the regular primary and secondary systems of the country. City streets, urban expressways, intercity highways, and paved rural roads. But what we have done is not nearly good enough. The simple fact is this. Neither the Congress, nor the road builders, nor the car manufacturers, nor you and I, the drivers, have as yet come up with accident-free driving. One driver in every five will have an automobile accident of some kind this year. During our congressional hearings on highway safety in 1972, someone installed this clock in the committee room as a grim reminder of how many Americans would lose their lives while we studied and debated the problem. Although improved roads have cut the death rate in ratio to the number of miles we travel, we're still suffering highway deaths at the average rate of 55,000 per year. If you can live with that figure, if it doesn't shock you, well, you really have no business on the highway. It shocks the Congress to realize how many Americans are being needlessly slaughtered. Since 1959, the Highway Investigating Subcommittee has been ceaselessly probing to learn the reasons why and to eradicate them. We are taking down the old signs and light posts mounted in concrete and steel, which killed too many wayward drivers. And we are replacing these with breakaway signs. If a sign or a light post is knocked down, well, just put it back up. Better to lose a sign and replace it than to lose a human life. Guardrails, once thoughtlessly mounted as poised lances, impaled too many vehicles. Now, these rails are being installed with their lead ends curved away from the traffic and buried. And a new system of curb design helps to guide the errant car back onto its highway lane rather than letting it go off the bridge. These were among the first changes implemented by Congress, doing away with the obvious hazards. New highways now embody these improved design features. Unfortunately, not all the old booby traps have yet been corrected from existing highways, but little by little, even they are disappearing. Through all the subcommittee's investigations, government and industry have been encouraged to research the problem of highway accidents. The device being shown here is one used by NASA in its studies of tires and their behavior on water-covered pavement. Skidding is an insidious thing. It sneaks up on you. Suddenly, you hit the brakes and, and you're out of control. Skidding, we found, is made possible by a number of things. In this case, the road design itself and the lack of adequately skid-resistant materials in the pavement. The driver of this station wagon is the mother 
of eight children. Before she can get her car out of its predicament, another slides into it. Now watch this truck. Only by great good fortune was a serious accident avoided here. Since this particular stretch of road has been redesigned, the accidents have been dramatically reduced. Federal and state highway officials are trying to get an inventory of such danger spots all over the country so they too can be corrected. But unfortunately, no highway design can be made absolutely skid proof. Accidents relate to three things, the road, the car, and the driver. Congress, the Federal Highway Administration, and the states are constantly working to improve the safety quality of the roads. As far as the car is concerned, Congress maintains constant restraint and pressure on the manufacturers to turn out safer products. Seat belts have been required. The quality of tires is being improved. Experiments are being conducted on shock absorbent bumpers. Most states require periodic inspection of automobiles to see that brakes and other components are in working order. But just so many things can be done to improve the roads and the cars. Obviously, everything that can be done should be done. It must be done. But with the driver, it's another matter. We can do little more than encourage education and caution. Most of the pictures you're about to see represent accidents that occurred on good roads and in well-maintained automobiles. These pictures are not pretty. They're not pleasant. But they are real. They've been shown here to impress upon you one fact. Lurking in front of you every moment you're in a car is the possibility of death or perhaps worse, lifelong pain and impairment. To help you survive in this real world of traffic environment, the committee has made a careful analysis of the most prevalent causes of accidents. We'd like to share this with you, together with a set of very simple guidelines which may save your life, or that of someone dear to you. First, a few words about that deadly combination, gasoline and alcohol. It seems trite to say again that nobody should drive while drinking. Everybody knows that. But too many Americans have translated that common sense injunction into a sort of weird and senseless parody. Others shouldn't drive while drinking. Of the 55,000 traffic deaths in this country last year, approximately 29,000 involved alcohol in some way. More than half of them. And the cruel injustice is that the drinker is not always the one who's killed. Is it worth it? The General Motors Company recently conducted some revealing experiments into the influence of alcohol upon the physical coordination, reflexes, and driving skills of a number of volunteers. In every case, the result was the same. The drivers were asked to negotiate a number of obstacle courses marked by rubber cones. Here's one driver negotiating the course when cold sober. Now here's the same driver after just three drinks. Now 
and here's another. The interesting thing is that each driver, after a few drinks, thought he was doing well. In fact, as the consumption of alcohol increased, so did the driver's confidence in his ability. They all thought they were doing fine. Do you think, perhaps, that you're an exception? So did they, in the scientific experiment. There were no exceptions. Next to alcohol, the second biggest contributing factor to fatal accidents is excessive speed. Frequently, the two exist in the same accident. And more than one third of the highway deaths, one or more of the drivers involved was exceeding the posted speed limit. And as with alcohol, the same tragic inequity applies. It's often the innocent who are killed. As with alcohol, the speeding syndrome is usually founded upon an illusion of boundless overconfidence. You're well coordinated, quick, and alert. So why pay attention to speed limits? Well, let's consider something that has nothing at all to do with human reflexes the limitations of the automobile. The braking and stopping distance of every automobile is directly related to the speed at which it's traveling. Repeated scientific tests have shown that it takes 120 feet to stop a car going 50 miles per hour. That's 40 yards. If the same car is going 70, it takes 270 feet, almost the length of a football field. And at 80 miles per hour, it takes 380 feet. Let's uh, watch an illustration of something that frequently happens on the road. The car in which the cameraman's traveling is proceeding at an acceptable pace along a residential street. In this case, if he had been exceeding his present speed by just five miles per hour, there would have been a collision. And any faster than that, a serious accident. Perhaps an injury or a fatality. It wouldn't have had anything to do with the driver's reflexes. So the next time you're worrying about the effects of being just a few minutes late to your next destination, please think of one other thing. Think of the effect of you not getting there at all. Think of the effect upon your family, those who care something about you. Another common cause of accidents is related to speeding, but it's a different problem. And that's the problem of tailgating. Tailgating is highest on the list of accidents which result in automobile damage and bodily injury. There are more rear-end collisions than any other kind. There is a rule of thumb, which is observed by those who take safe driving seriously. For every 10 miles per hour of speed, leave room for at least one automobile between your vehicle and the car ahead of you. In other words, at 30 miles per hour, the safe distance is no less than three car lengths behind the automobile in front. At 40 miles per hour, at least four car lengths. At 50, at least five car lengths. On heavily congested commuter roads at certain times of day with everyone fighting jealously for his place in line, unwilling to yield sufficient space. Here is what very frequently happens. This headline tells of a multiple accident in Los Angeles a few months ago in which 70 cars were involved in a chain reaction of tailgating collisions. Tailgating must inevitably lead to a wreck. If it doesn't take your life, it can cost you a lot of money in automobile repairs and days you don't really want to spend in a hospital. 
There is another variation of tailgating, which entirely too many drivers don't think about. But it gives severe headaches to the traffic accident experts. It's practiced this way. You're driving in the left lane, and another car is ahead of you in the lane to the right, going at about the same speed. You position yourself in his blind spot, just to his left rear. He cannot see you in his rearview mirror. He doesn't know you're there. He may glance at his mirror, decide there's nobody there, and pull out ahead of you into your lane. The accident would be as much your fault as his. But we're not talking about accidents, faults. We're talking about life and safety. Almost every car has two blind spots where its driver cannot see what's approaching behind. These two blind spots are just to the rear on the left and just to the rear on the right. If you'd avoid accidents, stay out of them. Here the rule of thumb is a simple one. If you're in the left lane, just so long as you can see the back of the driver's head through the rear window of his car, he can see you in his rear view mirror. When you cannot see him, he cannot see you. But if you approach him from the right lane, he can see you only when you can see his rear view mirror. In this relationship, he cannot see you. Finally, a word should be... Excuse me, I, I, was, I was going to say a word about the horn. Traffic experts are generally agreed that one particular practice is especially characteristic of the unsafe driver. He uses his horn excessively. He tries to clear his path with it, thus removing the annoyance of slowing down, as though it were a substitute for his brakes. It isn't. He's sometimes at his obnoxious worst in moving traffic, where his instant clarion announces his disdain for the world. Impatience is his watchword. And as he acts, so others react. A view of the guardrail indicates uh, some of the results of these collective attitudes. When you get right down to it, excessive use of the horn is the ultimate form of rudeness on the highway. Uh, just one other thing, and it really shouldn't have to be said. Since driving is a matter of life and death, it deserves total concentration. The eye of the driver should be on the road, not on the scenery. His mind should be on the task to which others in the car have entrusted their lives to his performance, not on entertaining them with conversation. Recently, W.T. Shorty Smith of Waco, Texas, was honored by the American Trucking Association for having completed four million miles of accident-free driving. Forty-three years of professional driving and not a single accident. Well, here's the way he puts it. Well, driving is my business, of course, but in the... In a sense, it's everybody's business. If I could boil the whole, boil it all down to three simple rules, I guess they'd go like this. First, try to drive with your full attention. Keep your whole mind on what you're doing. And the second, drive courteously. Be as nice to the other driver as you'd want him to be to you, even if they're not. The highway is no place for an argument or to teach people a lesson. Finally, drive defenselessly, as though you expect the other fellow to make a mistake. Often as not, he will. In those cases, it's up to you to save both his life and your own. The road the car, and the driver. 
these three. All three are involved in our effort to stop the senseless slaughter. By statistical probability, during the few minutes while you've been watching this film, somewhere in America, two people have been killed in automobile accidents. And perhaps a hundred have been injured. We're killing each other at the rate of 55,000 a year and leaving between two and four million people crippled as a result of highway accidents. And from a cold cash standpoint, auto accidents cost the American public almost twice as much every year as the total cost of building, maintaining, and improving our roads and streets. Together, we can reduce those figures dramatically. To accomplish that aim, we need to recognize that our highways, while the best and safest in the world, and even though in constant process of improvement, are not foolproof, in spite of all we can do, I guess they never will be. The American automobile, symbol of our affluence, our mobility, our freedom of movement, will never be made completely accident proof. So it's up to you, the driver, to drive as though your life depended on it. As a matter of fact, it does. multiple lane streets, you share the road with many more drivers. Carelessness and mistakes are potentially more dangerous. Let's review the rules for safe multiple lane driving. Keep to your own lane. When the lanes aren't marked, you must determine where they are and position your car accordingly. Ordinarily, you'll keep to the right except when passing or planning a left turn. But there are exceptions, such as on a street like this. Here, the center lane is often best because traffic in the other lanes must slow or stop for turns. During rush hours, when there's more traffic in one direction than the other, heavier traffic may be funneled into reversible lanes. These lanes are marked by removable stanchions, retractable curbs, or illuminated arrows, which change to follow the demands of traffic. Like multiple lane streets, multiple intersections increase your need for caution. An intersection such as this presents the same kinds of hazards you'll encounter in a normal intersection, but there are more of them. The traffic in this intersection will flow ahead, to the right, and to the left. Here's the entire traffic pattern. When we add pedestrian traffic, it becomes even more complex. In fact, the path of vehicles and pedestrians could cross at 96 places, 96 points of conflict. Traffic engineering has applied certain controls to eliminate traffic conflicts. For example, 
the four-phase light. And here's another way traffic engineers have tried to simplify left turns. Be sure to stop in the turn bay when waiting to make a left turn and turn only on the green arrow. Start your car. Proceed. Turn left at the next intersection. Turn right at the next intersection. Turn left at the next intersection. Turn right at the stop sign.
That kind of lane changing is extremely dangerous. Approach intersections with caution, even on a through street. You can't count on cross traffic waiting at their own stop sign. Turn left at the next street. Turn right. Notice that we are entering a one-way street. Right pavement always indicates a pedestrian crosswalk. Watch the parked cars on the left for signs of backing. Notice that your lanes narrow ahead. We'll want to turn left at the next corner, so keep in the left lane. This is a four-way stop, so take your turn. Notice this is a two-way street with only one lane of approaching traffic. Turn left into this one-way street. Park in the first available space.
leave your engine running, and wait for your next command. Proceed. Turn left at the next intersection. Pull over to the curb and park. Turn off your engine.
Benjamin Walker, age 34, has always considered himself a pretty good driver, just as you consider yourself a good driver. However, within the next 10 minutes, Ben Walker will be involved in an emergency. An emergency caused not by flagrant violations of the traffic laws, but rather by a combination of factors. Things most of us do from time to time when we drive. Things that usually don't get us into trouble, but could when they combine with other factors to produce an emergency in the making. Most of us commit minor driving errors. Although minor, they are nevertheless factors that could contribute to an accident. Most of us drive about safely while handling a variety of these factors. Most drivers can handle at least one such factor. Many can cope with two successfully, some three, four, five, and six. But when circumstances suddenly introduce one more factor than we can safely handle, this final factor can precipitate an emergency situation. What are factors? Almost anything. The sudden appearance of a pedestrian when you least expect him. The unexpected appearance of a warning sign. Road markers rising from nowhere on a road that you know as well as the palm of your hand. Equipment that's not working properly. Even a distraction created by a member of the family can be a contributing factor. Watch. A road sign can be a factor too. Even a personal habit, like lighting a pipe. The factors contributing to a potential emergency can pop up anywhere, in any type of vehicle. Many of the factors contributing to an emergency you may not be able to control. Case in point, the four cars you see before you, car A, B, C, and D. The drivers of each of these cars you see will commit one minor infraction, one factor that each of these drivers has committed before and yet driven safely. However, today these factors will combine to produce a potentially dangerous situation when one of these drivers introduces the final factor. Let's watch. Car A in the right-hand lane is driven by Jack Clink. Although he's driven for 30 years, Jack somehow never feels at ease on a modern throughway, especially when trying to locate the exit he wants. To the left of Jack in car B is Hugo McBain. Hugo is pulling a small trailer behind his car. The extra load is slowing Hugo down a good deal more than he expected. And as he often does, Hugo is driving in the left lane, making it difficult for those behind him to pass. Hugo will contribute the first factor. Directly behind Hugo in car C is Nancy Stone. Nancy is in a hurry, but she's waited too long before deciding to change lanes and pass Hugo on his right. Nancy will contribute the second factor. Opposite Nancy in the right lane is George Dolan in car D. He is following too closely behind car A. Momentarily, he's distracted by Nancy's pretty face. George contributes factors three and four. Jack Clink in car A will now add the final factor. By suddenly slamming on his brakes, he has just passed his exit. His sudden stop forces George behind him to pull out into the center lane, just as Nancy starts to pass. The result, this emergency situation. Jack Clink, concerned only with getting off the throughway, is not even aware he contributed the final factor. If just one of these drivers had eliminated his initial contribution, chances are the combination of factors needed to create this emergency in the making would never have existed. Let's take a closer look at the factors involved and discover what could have been done. Hugo McBain is driving too slowly in the left lane. If he had moved over to the right and let traffic pass, Nancy would never have pulled out. Or if Nancy had anticipated Hugo in the trailer and changed lanes earlier rather than at the very last moment, she could have avoided the emergency. If George in car C had allowed a greater distance between himself and Jack Clink's car, he would not have had to swerve into the center lane. Once Jack realized he missed his exit, 
he should have gone to the next exit. If Jack had thought before he slammed on his brakes, he could have eliminated the final factor that produced this four-car emergency. Often, an emergency situation develops, and you don't have anyone but yourself to blame for contributing all the factors. Take Hank Woods here, for example. Hank, too, is a pretty good driver, but he occasionally takes risks. Up to now, he's been able to keep the factors building up in check. However, this time, it will be different. The rain has made the pavement slick. Factor one. Hank Woods, anxious to reach his destination, sees no need to slow down. Factor two. In a hurry, he takes a calculated risk on unfamiliar roads. If that's not enough, Hank Woods takes another risk. He's driving on almost bare tires. Factor three. He knew their condition, but somehow he never got around to doing something about replacing them. His tires might be all right on dry pavement, but not on a slick, wet surface. They will skid if the brakes are applied suddenly. Now add the fourth factor, the worn out blades of his windshield wipers. They're causing the window to smear, making visibility difficult. Still, Hank feels confident he can handle these factors without trouble. And the odds are pretty good he can. At least they were, until this final factor was added, producing an emergency. Certainly the construction company deserves part of the blame for not marking the construction area properly. But even so, Hank Woods probably could have stopped if he hadn't taken so many risks beforehand. If he had eliminated any of these factors, he surely could have avoided this emergency. Hardly a day goes by when we don't witness this scene in our travels. A police officer and two irate motorists. Chances are the officer will determine who's at fault. More than likely, it'll be the man operating the car in the rear. He should have stopped in time. Yet many of the factors contributing to this accident will never come to light and are not even known to the motorists involved. Let's see what really happened. Let's see what factors really are involved. To begin with, Factor one was contributed by Millie Brown in the VW. Nervous and unsure of her driving ability, she should never have been on this ramp attempting to enter the expressway. The driver of this car, already on the expressway, created factor number two. Joe Willis, in the right-hand lane, refused to honor this merging traffic sign and moved to his left. If he had, he would have given Millie the room she needed. Millie, edging up, decides at the last minute she can't make it and stops. Meanwhile, assuming Millie entered the main flow of traffic, Marv Kramer turned to check the flow of traffic for his entry. By doing so, he created factor three, for Millie had stopped again. Sid Wimble, following closely in the last car, now contributes the final factor. He lights his pipe at the exact moment Marvin hits his brakes. The result, this traffic accident. Finally getting her opening, Millie left the area, oblivious to the fact she contributed to Marv's and Sid's emergency. If any one of the four drivers involved had eliminated the factor he or she created, this accident might have been avoided. Regardless of where we live or what we do, the automobile plays an important part in our lives. In our rubber-tired society, most accidents occur close to home and when we least expect them. Case in point, Harriet Wingate on her way to the shopping center with her family. Harriet realizes it's dangerous to have her child standing on the seat beside her, but Bobby enjoys it and he's close by where she can watch him. Besides, putting him in the back with the older children only leads to trouble. Unwittingly, this will be factor one in an emergency in the making. 
Harriet's speedometer indicates she's not really driving fast, although maybe a few miles above the posted speed limit. But with a child standing on the front seat, it's too fast. Factor two. Harriet knows she should keep her eyes on the road at all times, but she's a mother too. She has to keep an eye on Bobby. She's done this many times. Factor three, Harriet's inattention to the road. Now let's add a fight between the children in the back seat. Factor four. And to this, let's add the final factor, this car. True, the driver should have waited until Harriet went by, but he too was in a hurry. The emergency, just a quick stop, no collision. But as a result, Bobby has a bumped forehead, maybe even a chipped tooth. How could Harriet's emergency have been avoided? Eliminate one or more of the factors that contributed to it. Watch. This time, Harriet has eliminated most of her distractions by having the children safely belted in. Even Bobby wears a safety harness. To eliminate another factor, Harriet merely drives a little slower. By so doing, Harriet now can handle the situation before her with the driver of the other car, the only factor to cope with. Harriet now can stop in time without fear of hurting Bobby or anyone else in this emergency situation. Factors have a way of building up, and if we aren't careful, by the time we realize what's happening, it can be too late. Watch as they build for Ben Walker, returning with his family from a weekend in the country. Factor one, Ben Walker is tired. It's been a long day. He's been on the road in the blazing sun since early afternoon. His eyes can no longer focus. He knows he should stop, but he has to get home. Darkness is setting in. Factor two. What Ben doesn't realize is that darkness is a factor in more than half of all fatal automobile accidents. Factor number three, Ben's station wagon is overloaded. Unknown to Ben, this is causing his low beams to shoot high, blinding the oncoming drivers. They respond by flicking their bright lights. They're trying to tell Ben to dim his headlights, but Ben has already done this. Not realizing this, one driver retaliates with his bright lights, blinding and confusing Ben. Factor four. Unable to see, Ben swerves to his right and runs into the final factor, a highway marker placed too close to the road. If any or all of the factors that caused this had been eliminated, Ben Walker and his family would not now be in a predicament. Remember, risks, no matter how small and unimportant, are nevertheless risks and may prove to be the final factor when combined with other factors to create emergencies. Remember this the next time you drive. Remember it the next time you take a chance. Don't get trapped. The time you take to eliminate the factors that contribute to an accident may keep you from becoming a part of an emergency in the making. travel to other cities and states, you will find yourself driving on the open road. When you do, you will discover that good drivers can travel these roads in safety. Highways place special demands on the driver for two reasons. The first is speed. On the open stretches of most of these roads, maximum legal speeds are permitted. On other stretches, lower limits are posted because experience has shown that too many accidents occur above limits. The second special feature of highways is interference along the right of way. Unlike superhighways or expressways, these roads have cross traffic. There are stop signs and signal lights. 
there are passenger cars and trucks, motorcycles and bicycles, wild animals, and pedestrians. These are important characteristics of highway driving. Now, let's ask and answer some questions, beginning with, is your car ready for the road? Before starting on any trip beyond the city limits, it's a good idea to be sure that your car is in condition to make the trip. If there is anything wrong with the engine, exhaust system, transmission, or brake system, you'll be better off to have your car repaired. Otherwise, you may be caught out on the lonely road, miles away from assistance. Assuming that your car is in good general condition, you will still want to check fuel, windows, water, oil, battery, lights and signals, all five tires, tools and jack. On any trip into unfamiliar territory, it's a smart thing to carry a map, some telephone money, and if night driving is involved, a flashlight with live batteries. In addition to being sure you're ready for the road, consider the weather and ask, is the road ready for me? Another question that will concern you from one end of the trip to the other is this. How's my speed? Most states have definite posted speed limits for the highways. These, of course, are only permissive and do not apply during adverse weather or heavy traffic conditions. In good weather, you may soon find yourself driving at the maximum speed permitted by law. At first, it may seem quite fast. This is important. If it feels too fast, it is too fast. And you should slow down to a speed that you can comfortably handle. On the other hand, after driving the maximum speed for a while, it may actually seem slow. You will feel capable of driving safely at even faster speeds. And this feeling will be reinforced as violators whip. Before you temptation, however, cons 50 miles, if you drive 10 miles above the speed limit, you'll be lucky to gain as much as two minutes. On the other hand, while you are gaining experience, you don't want to drive too slowly either, because this can be dangerous. Try to match your speed with the pace of the traffic. The time to drive at slower speeds is when your visibility has been reduced by darkness or adverse weather or when the condition of the road surface reduces the distance in which you can stop. Our next question is, what about pedestrians? They should wear something white at night or carry a flashlight or a handkerchief. but all too often, they don't. So it's up to you to watch the road ahead and the road shoulder for pedestrians, especially for children. They are sometimes harder to see and their actions are not predictable. Every year, motorists get involved in serious collisions in a last second effort to avoid hitting pedestrians.
By spotting them well in advance, you can plan to give them extra clearance. And be prepared to slow down or stop. You may never have thought of the next question, but it's a good one. Can you keep your car on the road? In many serious accidents, the driver gets into trouble without involving another vehicle. How are accidents like this caused? Inattention, sometimes complicated by excessive speed, is almost always a factor. A curve lies ahead. A sign cautions the driver. But he fails to pay attention. His car hits the curve, and he suddenly finds himself unable to handle the turn without a skid. If you should happen to drive onto the shoulder, don't be too hasty about getting back to the road surface. Most road shoulders are drivable. Just hold your car straight until it slows down. This is true even with a flat tire. Then, with the car under control, at slow speed, return it to the pavement. If you find yourself driving off the pavement unintentionally, you'll know there's something wrong with your driving. You may be going too fast and should slow down. Or, you're not paying attention to your driving. Or, you're fatigued or sleepy and should stop driving. As we have seen, control of your car at highway speeds is vitally important. Because this is true, always keep your car centered in its lane. Always approach curves and hills with close attention. Reduce speed at any time the condition of the road affects your control of the car. Accident records show that many drivers do not slow down enough for wet roads. Now, here are some answers to the question. How do I guard against collisions? We have seen how a great many serious highway accidents occur because the driver loses control of his car. Even more are caused by collisions, mostly with other vehicles, but also with pedestrians, trains, animals, and roadside objects. Collisions result from improper use of lanes, such as passing where it's prohibited. Changing lanes without looking or signaling. Or failing to maintain good visibility and a safe space cushion between the vehicle ahead and the one behind. You avoid collisions by giving full-time attention to your driving and taking precautions. You observe all no-passing signs and road markings. And even in the absence of signs, you never pass on hills or on blind curves, bridges, intersections, or at rail crossings. It's simply a matter of being patient and waiting for a chance to pass when you can see it is safe. You pick a moment when the road ahead is clear for a good long distance. You check to the rear in both lanes to be sure that no one is overtaking you at close range. You signal when necessary, move into the left lane and go on through.
When you see both of his headlights in your mirror, you move back into the right lane. A great deal depends upon your ability to estimate the speed and distance of oncoming cars. Don't stare at them. You can't afford to rivet your attention on anything. Watch the road ahead and make all other observations with intermittent glances. On many curves, you have an excellent chance to look ahead, study oncoming traffic, judge its speed and distance. Later, as you enter a passing zone, this information can be useful. When passing, overtake the other car so that you're past him in a few seconds. Be on the alert for any drifting on the part of the other car and for any changes in the situation ahead and behind. Never hesitate to make a safe retreat from a passing maneuver if anything occurs up front that will reduce your margin of safety. Drop back and wait for a better time. Similarly, never attempt to pass a car if you find that you will have to complete the maneuver in a no-passing zone. Watch out for other drivers who may misjudge speed and distance when passing. Slow down if necessary to increase the margin of safety. Don't wait too long like this driver. That cloud of dust to the right is a clue. It warns of a car approaching from a side road. Good highway drivers avoid emergencies by looking far ahead, constantly interpreting the scene on the road, the shoulders, and all approaches. Your eyes should also be in constant motion, scanning the sides and rear, so that no situation can take you by surprise. From time to time, you may drive on a three-lane highway. The center lane is used as a passing lane for cars in both directions. When you move into the passing lane, be very sure that no nearby car from the opposite direction is also using it. You don't want to be in the middle of a three or four car collision. Good drivers treat a three lane road like a two lane passing. They time their moves to avoid being the middleman in a dangerous squeeze like this. It is also a practical idea during the daytime to turn on your headlights while in the center lane if two or more cars are approaching in the distance. One of the most risky things a driver can do on the open highway is to follow another car too closely or permit another car to follow him too closely. This is especially hazardous on a two-lane road. If the first car suddenly stops, there will be a three-car collision. A good rule for spacing is this. For each 10 miles per hour of speed, allow at least one car length between you and the car ahead. At 50 miles an hour, therefore, you need a cushion of more than five car lengths. And you need the same cushion to the rear. If another car persists in following you too closely, Increase your speed to widen the distance if you're driving below the speed limit. If he still hangs on, pick a safe time and place to stop so that he is forced to pass by. You'll lose a little time, but it's worth it. You can enjoy the use of the highways in safety for years to come by thoroughly checking the condition of the so that you know it is roadworthy. Never exceeding posted speed limits and always setting lower limits of your own when driving conditions reduce visibility or shorten your safe stopping distance. Scanning the road shoulders for signs of pedestrians and bike riders. Keeping your car under control and on the road 
by giving full time attention to where you are driving and how you're driving. Steering clear of collision situations by maintaining a space cushion to the front and rear. And passing only when you know it's safe. Millions of cars on the highway. A driver in each car controlling speeding steel and glass. As a driver, you must learn to exist with all the other drivers on the road. Can you trust them to do the right thing? Can they trust you? Good driving on your part is not enough. You must learn to drive defensively to always be on the lookout for mistakes the other fellow on the road may make. Chuck Hinman is a typical driver. Has he learned to drive defensively? Chuck, do you think you're a good driver? Seems that you are. You keep within the legal speed limit, and you leave plenty of room for other cars to pass. But this is a through street with stop signs on the corners of the intersecting streets. I wonder, are you aware of these intersecting streets? Chuck, watch out! Yes, you had the right of way. But Chuck, you have to remember that there are many careless drivers and pedestrians. Some are downright criminal because of the risks they take. You can't depend on their alertness or on their concern for the safety of other motorists. It's up to you to watch out to drive defensively. Chuck, what's that ball? How can you hurt a ball? You can't. Just remember, a ball belongs to a child. You were lucky, Chuck, but luck isn't defensive driving. A defensive driver is always prepared for the worst. Defensive driving means constant watching, watching for potential trouble all around you. Chuck, aren't you a little too close to that car? Bumper chasing is not defensive driving. You know how long it takes to stop for every 10 miles of speed, you should keep one car length distance between you and the car in front. That's better. A defensive driver allows a little additional distance as a margin of safety. Now we'll let you drive for a while without making any comments. But we'll be watching you. And at the end of your trip, we'll analyze your driving ability.
Now we'll go back and review Chuck's driving tactics. Have you ever noticed how some drivers fiddle with their radios and lose sight of what happened to them? Remember seconds. Always keep your eyes on the road. Chuck wasn't watching for the other driver's mistake. He should have reduced his speed to avoid a potential collision. Do you like to sneak through a traffic light? If you do, you don't understand the meaning of defensive driving. Just assume that a car on the cross street is going to try to sneak through too. When you make a fast left turn in front of traffic, you're assuming that other drivers on the road are safer drivers than you. That is certainly not defensive driving. And the defensive driver is always on the lookout for pedestrians who can be even more unpredictable than the worst automobile driver. Here is an inevitable hazard against which a defensive driver will guard himself. It's the blind spot in a traffic pattern. Beware of hills, sharp curves, or large vehicles that interfere with your vision. If you can't see what's ahead, you should always expect the worst to be there. Don't trust to luck on the highway. Children can be unpredictable and irresponsible. They know far less about safety than you do. Honking the horn is not enough. A defensive driver would have used his brakes. Although the car ahead is parked off the road, an alert driver will notice such clues as exhaust fumes, turned front wheels, and a driver in the front seat. They all point to a potential collision. Superhighways are built for safe, high-speed driving. Chuck should have turned into the acceleration lane, and then, when traffic cleared, moved carefully into the right-hand lane. He shouldn't let a good road tempt him into dangerous driving. It's wise to stay in one lane when driving on any road. But if you have to change lanes, check traffic to make sure that the lane you're entering is clear and signal your intentions when necessary. This is not just courtesy, it's self-preservation. Have you decided how you'd have reacted to this reckless driver? Would you have started a race on a public highway? A defensive driver has no need to prove himself on the highway. To him, a car is a means of transportation, not a symbol of power. might just as well have been you. It happens every day. It's something you should defend against every moment you're driving your car. It's your choice. For your audience,
Good morning, Mr. Alec. Sir, Mr. Relic is here. Yes, sir. Right in, Mr. Relic. Thank you. So very lovely. Who'd ever guess that such beauty and softness could be so very, very dead? You'd better save your charm for him. I have a feeling you're going to need it. <laughs> Morning, Chief. Say, I just had lunch with a friend. Ah, of Mr. Relic. The great Mr. Relic. Supervisor of our top accounts. My number one boy. Relic, the fireball, the quota buster. Push your buttons, Mr. Relic. Come, come, man. You know which ones they are. The year to date. Our top accounts. Your accounts, Mr. Relic. Take a look at account number one. For the first time in our history, a leveling off, the possibility of a decline, despite more potential customers than we've ever had. Well, sir, it's the competition. Uh, I've got some figures. The same is true of account number two. The market's in orbit. Our sales are sitting on the launching pad. And it's not just domestic sales. It's worldwide on both accounts. Well, sir, if you'll just uh, take a look at these studies made of the competition's activities, I'm sure that you realize... I realize. I realize, Mr. Relic, that these two accounts have never failed to be our most profitable operations. Now, they're barely holding their own. Well, sure, the market is bigger than ever, but the competition has come up with some, some truly remarkable products and techniques. They're spending millions on research, and they're telling their story to anyone who'll listen. Would you suggest we get out of the business? No, no. But we've got to reevaluate our sales goals. Our number one and number two products are rapidly becoming outmoded. Yes, I know. You think our best potential lies in the number three account? I'd stake my life on it, sir. Just look at these sales figures. The annual increases. 50,000 sales? <laughs> Peanuts. Well, that's right. 50,000 today is less than 5% of the annual sales total. But that third account represents an untapped market with a fantastic potential. What do you think would happen if we got in back of number three and really pushed? 87 million potential customers in the United States alone. Now, I don't have the foreign figures, but I would estimate that it might be 10 or 12 times that much. And our competitors? What are they doing? That's the beauty of it. Oh, they're plugging away with brochures, statistics, TV spots, radio, and some motion pictures. But the public isn't buying it, because people are human. It only takes one second of human weakness, and we write up another sale. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Pull out all stops on account number three, Mr. Relic. But keep hammering away at accounts number one and two. They've been our bread and butter too long. Don't worry, Chief. We're far from beaten here. You'll see number three will be our top seller yet. I'll have copies made of these for you. He wants copies made of these immediately. I'm returning to the field. I have your monthly sales records typed. I was out of labels, though. Put them on my desk.
Pardon me, are you on daylight savings or regular time here? Fast time now. Uh, are you new in town? Yes, just got in a minute ago, as a matter of fact. I bet you some kind of salesman or something. Got any free samples from that pretty bag of young? Uh, no free samples. Okay. I'm sorry, friend, some other time. Thank you. Hold on. I'm Dr. Cecil Relic. I'm consulting on this case. How's he getting along? Well, he's going to surgery, one of those synthetic heart valve jobs. Oh, it looks pretty weak. Mr. Uh, yes, Mr. Roberts, that's the name. Uh, well, let's get to work. Is surgery still on the same floor? 11th floor, he's scheduled for room eight. Mr. Carl Roberts, mitral stenosis. Oh, brother, a clam has a better heart than this guy. Good boy, Relic. It could be one of those days. Like the Midas touch, everything turns cold. Back to the left ventricle. Stimulus right over here. Cover me over, please. Stimulus. The heart's beating normally now. Let's get out of here. your ventricles, Dr. Reed. Congratulations. Thank you, Doctor. Uh... Damn Roberts and his new heart valve. I'll keep in touch, Roberts. Ulcers, yeah. kidney infection. Fracture. Oh, no. oh. Ah, this looks promising. May I help you? 
Oh, yes, nurse. Uh, I'm Dr. Livingston Relic. I'm new on the staff. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hoke asked me to check up on Mrs. Genesee. I understand that she underwent exploratory surgery this morning. Uh, do you have any word from pathology uh, about malignancy? Not a word. I'll notify Dr. Hope that you're here. Oh, no, no, don't bother. Uh, I'm having lunch with him later. Just to show me to Mrs. Genesee's room. Room 194. She's still out. I understand her husband died of cancer only last year. Poor thing. Dr. Campbell. She's still sleeping. I'm Dr. Hoke. Oh, hi, uh, Doc. I'm Theodore Relic, uh, Miss Genesee's brother from Chicago. You know, since her husband died, I've been kind of keeping an eye on her. Uh, I want to know, Doc, uh, how serious is it? Sure. Let's step out in the hall. Oh. It's odd that uh, she didn't mention you, although I'm very glad you're here, because she's certainly going to need all the strength she can muster. Mr. Relic, your sister is a very sick woman. I'm going to lay it on the line. She has cancer. Well, give it to me straight, Doc. How long she got? Oh, if you'd ask me that uh, a year or so ago, I'd have said six months at the most. But with our new Betatron, I think we have an excellent chance of arresting it. What do you mean? She might recover? She has a very deep-seated tumor. However, I'm sure that the new Betatron can reach it. See, this has a, an output of 60 million electron volts. Consequently, it is capable of delivering higher doses of radiation in shorter periods of time. Therefore, it won't damage the healthy tissue around these deep-seated tumors. Now, to your sister, that means life instead of death. That's amazing. I didn't know you had a machine like that. Well, I think it's just a matter of time until we eliminate this killer. Mr. Relic? You all right, Mr. Relic? Uh, look a little pale. Uh, no, nah, I'm all right. That's just the relief, that's all. I uh, had a very difficult morning now. Got... Thanks, please thanks for your courtesy. Mrs. Smith, please return to your room. Scratch Genesee. What a morning. Number one and two accounts are in even worse shape than I'd figured. You spend thousands of years building up an account that falls apart in a decade or two. I need a drink. Why didn't I change accounts when I had a chance? Something nice and dependable like war. Even murder. Life expectancy going up almost daily. It's inflation, that's what it is. Oh, I want to show you this shirt. Isn't it lovely? And I got it for half price just because of that buttonhole. It's gorgeous, Emma. It's for Walter's father. He's going to be 83 tomorrow. And after the party, he's driving up to Lake George to go fishing. What? No water skiing? Well, of all the nerve. And him with a purple briefcase. You know, it was kind of nice, though. I wonder if Grandpa would want one. Old boy, get hot. We can land a customer a minute on this third account. Here we go. 
Hi, kids. Say, how would you like to make a fast five dollars? You bet your boots, Dad. What do we have to do? It's simple. Just deliver this envelope for me in Milton Square inside of 15 minutes. You think you can do it? Jimmy's a fabulous driver. He'll get it there, won't you, Tiger? As good as there. Fine. You got the envelope. Here's the five bucks. Now, remember, you got just 14 minutes. Go to it. Don't worry, Dad. All lights are green. I'll have it there in 10 minutes. I'd bet my life on it. Good hunting, mister. I'll be seeing you. I'd bet on it. The odds are in my favor. All you young drivers are pushovers. Cocky, overconfident, so sure of yourself that you're careless. You think you're too old to cry? Too strong? Don't fool yourself. You'll cry like a baby when you're stretched out on the asphalt with pain tearing at every inch of your body, wondering if you're going to live or die. And you'll pray like you've never prayed before, because you're not sure now. Not sure you'll see daylight again. But you'll see me. I'll come with a sudden wave of darkness. Saveway Supermarket. Yes, they're still on sale. Well, we close in 10 minutes, but if you can get over here before then, I'll save you a couple of choice cuts. Okay, you rush right over. Thank you. So simple. Give them a motive and they'll furnish the crime. Murder. Themselves or someone else. Yes, I gave you an excuse to speed, and you did. Rush right over. Oh, boy. Floor it. Speed it up. Don't worry about the unexpected. Don't worry about anything. Just like this fella. He had a lot in his favor that afternoon. A new station wagon. Good road conditions on a four-lane highway. Only one thing on his mind. A desire to get home. Faster. Faster. He was on the truck before he realized it. No time to swing out. A bullet can't turn in flight. But don't believe me. Try it yourself. And I'll see you then. It must be a great sensation out there. Really living. You're not kidding. Those guys must feel like kings with all that speed and power in their hands. Yeah. You ever tried it? No. Not with my responsibility. Besides, I couldn't afford one of those babies. Well, you've got one of those new X2 supercharged motors, haven't you? They're supposed to take a milk truck up to 130. Why don't you open it up on the way home? Oh, if I were alone, I might try it. Say, how'd you know I had an X2 engine in my car? I'll live it up a little. Family might get a kick out of it. 
Show me old bands as good as those young fellas out there. I might. Live it up a little. A family might get a kick out of it. As opposed to him having 30. A great sensation. Really living. Show the family. Live it up a little. I think I found what's causing your noise. It's a big bump on the inside of that left front tire. Oh, no. Don't tell me I need a new tire. Well, it could go any minute. Then again, it might last a thousand miles or more. I'd let it go if I were you. Penny saved is a penny earned, you know. My stars. You could have sold me a tire, too. I think you're right. I'm sure I can make it to Akron. It's only 30 miles. This is for you. No, no. It's company policy, you know. Believe me, it was my pleasure. They'll never learn. They'll save a dollar and lose their lives to me. You drivers never learn. You'll press your luck, and that makes you my kind of people. My good customers. You'll gamble on anything. The train hit the car broadside. Carried it 169 feet, rolled it over four times. A 16-year-old boy and 24-year-old man dead at the scene. The 22-year-old girl who was driving pronounced dead at the hospital. Her three-year-old son lived only a few hours. The 16-year-old boy was arrested just an hour earlier for speeding, going 90 miles an hour. It's an odd thing. Birds of a feather, drivers who take chances, seem to flock together. No, you'll never learn. If you don't believe me, keep pressing your luck. But that instant before impact, look beside you. I'll be there. Hey, I'm a salesman myself. I can't cover territory like you can. 600 miles in one day. It's really driving. I should be in Albany tonight, but that's 200 more miles. I'm bushed. I think I'm going to head for the nearest motel. Yeah, but if you don't get there tonight, you'll have to drive it tomorrow and waste all those prime daylight sales hours. That's the way I always look at it. You're right. Guess I better be on my horse. Here's my card. If you ever get to Chicago, look me up. We'll have a drink. Oh, fine. Here's mine. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. Hope we get together again sometime. third account the bloodiest in the history of the world.
you by because you're human, with hundreds of human weaknesses. Recklessness, impatience, carelessness, disregard for the safety of your fellow man or yourself. I'll sell and you'll buy in a moment of weakness. Don't look for me, I'll find you.